these last weeks as we have been walking with Jesus, we've seen him do some amazing things. He fed a crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children on one occasion. He walked on water. He quieted a storm. In between, or right after that, he fed another crowd of 4,000 men plus women and children. And he healed a young girl who was afflicted with a demon. We've heard Jesus speak with authority as he has stepped into the ring with the Pharisees, the legal experts, and the Sadducees. They've debated clean and unclean. They have looked at signs of the coming Messiah. And then we heard Peter's bold confession. Who do people say that I am, Jesus asked. Who do you say that I am, Jesus asked. And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So what's next? Where did the disciples go from there? Where do we go from there? What difference does that make? For the disciples, with all that they had experienced with Jesus, they thought, oh boy, we're, gonna, we're, we're in on something here. We're out on the ground floor. There is no way but up for us. We're going to have power and prestige. We can get rid of this old fishing boat and get a luxury liner. And we'll be hosted by kings and leaders. And everybody's going to be coming to us. It's just going to be amazing. It's going to be exciting. Everybody's going to be talking about it. You may be thinking, oh, those silly disciples. But if we look in the mirror, we kind of desire some of the same things, don't we? We're not looking for a life of sacrifice, a life of persecution, a life of ill ease. I mean, we don't even like to have our schedules inconvenienced. We want power, we want prestige, we want authority, we, we want security, we want calm, we want peace. And we too would love to have blessings. And if God drops those blessings in our bank account, wow, that would be great. But no. But right after this, Jesus starts talking to the disciples about a different way. In Matthew 16, 21, he says, from that, it says, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and legal experts, and that he had to be killed and raised on the third day. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus starts talking about death, about betrayal, about crucifixion, about suffering, about persecution and pain. It's a bit of a spin, isn't it? It's almost like a 180 that the disciples ended up on. And so it's no wonder that Peter does what he does. As we continue in Matthew 16, Peter took hold of Jesus, scolding him, began to correct him. God forbid, Lord, this won't happen to you. It's almost like Peter's coming up to Jesus and grabbing him by the collar and said, What are you saying? You can't be saying this. With all we've seen, with who you are, there must be something greater. And the disciples, were, they were in the greater. Multiple times, Jesus walks in on conversations where they're trying to figure out who is the greatest. But Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stone that could make me stumble, for you are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. It's interesting that Jesus gets mad at Peter for Peter trying to save Jesus from himself. But the reality is that Peter is looking for a crossless Christ. A crossless Christianity. One that doesn't have suffering, persecution, pain, and death. And that version of Christianity has some appeal for us as well, right? We don't like pain and suffering. We don't like persecution. We want to be liked. We like to, to have a comfortable existence. We would like to have some authority, some say in things. 
We like things to kind of go our way, and boy, it would be great if we could even be the popular kid in the class, right? But that isn't always the way of Jesus. That's not always what Jesus calls us to, if he ever calls us to that. Jesus said to his disciples, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me will find them. Before we get to what Jesus is saying, let's look at what Jesus is not saying here. He's not saying all who want to follow me need to memorize their Bibles and know everything that's in here. He doesn't say all who want to follow me need to come to Bible class every Sunday. He doesn't say all who want to follow me need to do their devotions every single day. He doesn't say all who want to follow me need to come and sit for 60 to 75 minutes every Sunday. And by the way, it's good if you put something in the plate as well when it gets passed later in the service. Jesus doesn't say any of those things. It's not to say that any of those things are bad things. But it's very tempting for us to limit our Christianity to a series of things that we check off on our to-do list. I've read my Bible. I'm, I'm, I'm learning more about the genealogy of the, the judges. What good that does anybody, I don't know. I'm sure there's a Bible scholar out there that would differ with me. Um, but there's some stuff in here that I'm going, it's interesting that it's in here, but I don't know what that does today. It's good to study our Bibles. It's good to have devotional time. It's good to worship and to give. But Jesus doesn't stop there. In our modern age, we've kind of reduced discipleship to being Bible scholars. You are a disciple if you know a lot of facts about what's in this book. But discipleship for Jesus is following his footsteps. To look like Jesus. To live like Jesus. To act like Jesus. To love like Jesus. To speak the words that Jesus would speak. And sometimes that means denying ourselves saying no to ourselves, saying no to having things our way, saying no to having everything and having it right now, saying no to some opportunities because they don't line up with what Jesus values. I mean, we may want to do those things, but Jesus may not want us to be there. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, To endure the cross is not a tragedy. It is the suffering which is the fruit of an exclusive allegiance to Jesus Christ. When it comes, it is not an accident, but a necessity. It is not the sort of suffering which is inseparable from this mortal life, but the suffering which is an essential part of the specifically Christian life. And for those of you who don't, who don't know Bonhoeffer's story, he knew suffering. He was in Nazi Germany when Hitler took over. And eventually he helped lead an underground church movement and was part of a failed assassination attempt on Hitler's life. Eventually, Von Haver ended up in jail. And he was executed just before Germany fell at the end of World War II. He knew suffering. He knew the cost of discipleship, the cost of following Jesus in a world that didn't want to hear about it. Also, in the last century, in 1961, there were freedom riots going on throughout the South. And these freedom riders, many times, were, were college students, and they faced all sorts of hostility and persecution. Their buses were lit on fire, they were spit on, they were beaten, and yet they kept on doing it. There was one group that that went and they were from Nashville, a group of college students, they wanted to keep this freedom ride movement going. And they sang, and they sang a bunch of hymns and songs with such joy and such energy that they annoyed the people that opposed them. But yet, right before they got on that bus, they wrote out their last Old Testament. 
It would be easy to dismiss and enjoy the exuberance of all they didn't know what they were getting themselves into. Until you look at the wills that they left behind, knowing that they might face death for pursuing this cause. It's a glimpse of what it looks like to follow Jesus. As we follow Jesus, we can expect pushback from the world in which we live. This world is no longer designed, no longer functioning in the way that God created it in the first place. And the devil likes stirring things up. He likes stirring the pot. He likes making things excessively challenging and spinning things that are bad into something that is good and appealing. There are times where we're going to look at our ballot and go, boy, who do I vote for? Because we see, well, this candidate has things that are, uh, are things of Jesus, but they've got this other stuff that I'm really uncomfortable with. But then there's this other candidate that has these other things that are like the way of Jesus, and oh, boy, some other stuff I'm really uncomfortable with. We run the same thing with ballot issues. We run the same thing with business opportunities with friends. Following Jesus is very hard. Because sometimes it's causing us to sift through a lot of stuff to figure out, okay, what would Jesus do if he was here in this instance? What would Jesus say? What would Jesus not say? How would Jesus encounter this person? How would he receive this person? But we're called to follow Jesus. And follow him on that path. And so we dig into the Gospels. We dig into the story of Jesus. And we see how he interacted with people. And we see the things that he said and the things that he didn't say. And we say, okay, that's a start. And then we ask the Spirit to continue to lead and guide us. As we take up our cross and follow him. The cross is something interesting. We see it as an instrument that marks death, don't we? We see white crosses on the roadsides to mark accident sites. We see crosses in our cemeteries. And yet at the same time, we have a cross here in our worship space. And when someone is baptized, they receive the sign of the cross on their forehead and on their heart to mark them as one for whom Jesus died and rose again. Our world looks at the cross as something of death. But yet in the cross, Jesus gives us new life. He gives us new life and a new way of living. And we see Jesus denying himself early on in his ministry as he's out in the wilderness fasting for 40 days and he is tempted by the devil. And the devil comes along and he says, oh, hey, Jesus, you're hungry. I know who you are. You're the son of God. Why don't you take that rock and turn it into a little bread? But Jesus doesn't do that. He comes back and he says, it is written, people don't live only by bread, but by every word spoken by God. And if you look at Jesus' ministry, especially what we've encountered recently in Matthew, we find Jesus feeding people. We find Jesus giving away food to vast crowds of people expecting nothing in return. And then next, the, the devil led him up to the pinnacle of the temple, and he said, hey, take the plunge, just jump off. Because God, he'll send his angels, he won't stuff your foot against the stone. But Jesus comes back to him, and he says, go away, Satan, because it's written. You will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Jesus said no to the offer of prosperity. He said no to the offer of material wealth. And he lived a very simple life, reaching out to those people who were living on the margins and touching them with the wealth of his grace, his acceptance, and his love, providing healing and providing hope. Lastly, in Matthew's account, the devil takes Jesus to a mountaintop and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, oh, this could be yours. Just one simple thing. Just one small thing. Bow down and worship me. And Jesus says, 
Go away, Satan, because it's written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve only Him. Jesus didn't take shortcuts. He didn't cash in on his privileged position as God's son. He didn't do things solely for himself. But he denied himself and gave of himself wherever he was, reaching out and impacting other people's lives. Because that's what Jesus does. And if you're like me, you're going, oh boy, that's a tall order, isn't it? How do we do that? Lloyd Ogilvy, a former chaplain of the U.S. Senate, once said, We say, but Lord, I cannot. And God says, I'm glad to hear you say that. Through you, I can. It is only by the power of God that we're able to follow Jesus. It's only by the Holy Spirit who has called us to faith and who was there when we were claimed and cleansed in baptism that we're able to walk in the footsteps of our Lord and our Savior. And yet we also hear that when we are at risk of reducing our faith to just some, some simple religious tasks, gathering with a holy honey puddle of special saints, that we're falling short of what God calls us to. He calls us to an adventure. An adventure that goes through this world and causes us to rub shoulders with all sorts of people, many of whom are different than we are. And some of that makes us uncomfortable. But no matter where we go, God is with us. And as James reminds us, faith without works is dead. And I would add, I mean, you're not supposed to add to the Bible, but I'd say faith and following Jesus without a life of works is a dead faith. It's a dead, <laughs> dead followership. As we're reminded in Ephesians chapter 2, you are saved by God's grace because of your faith. This salvation is God's gift. It is not something you possessed. It is, something, it is not something you did that you can be proud of. Instead, we are God's accomplishment, created in Christ Jesus to do good things. Good things that God planned. God planned for these good things to be the way that we live our lives. We have been saved. Saved by God's grace, nothing that we do to earn or deserve that grace. And so we respond to God's unconditional acceptance by living as his disciples and walking in the ways of Jesus. Paul articulates that very well in our reading from Romans 12 today. And I'm going to have you, I'm going to, this, this is a little dangerous, especially with a little warmer room. But I'm going to have you relax. Close your eyes if you want to. And let these words from our second reading from Romans 12, 9 to 21 wash over to you and let the Spirit speak to you through this text today. Love should be shown without pretending. Hate evil and hold on to what is good. Love each other like the members of your family. Be the best at showing honor to each other. Don't hesitate to be enthusiastic. Be on fire in the spirit as you serve the Lord. Be happy in your hope. Stand your ground when you're in trouble. And devote yourselves to prayer. Contribute to the needs of God's people. And welcome strangers into your home. Bless people who harass you. Bless and don't curse them. Be happy with those who are happy. And cry with those who are crying. Consider everyone as equal. And don't think that you are better than anyone else. Instead, associate with people who have no status. Don't think that you're so smart. Don't pay back anyone for their evil actions with evil actions. But show respect for what everyone else believes is good. If possible, to the best of your ability, live at peace with all people. 
Don't try to get revenge for yourselves, but leave room for God's wrath. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. By doing this, you will pile burning coals of fire upon his head. Don't be defeated by evil, but defeat evil with good. I think that sums up the way of Jesus. So, some questions for you to ponder. How did you see God at work in your life this week? How did you see God this week? What insight did you receive today? And maybe it hasn't come yet. Maybe there's something that's going to stand out to him, or maybe you'll go back and look at these readings and something will pop for you. But what insight did you receive today? And how can you live that insight this week, especially for the good of others?